We have some bushes that sit outside of our our house, right in front of our house, and recently Sherry's said, uh, you know, Lance, I think I want to remove these bushes, and she has this plan to to transplant the bushes someplace else, and and, uh, right away I start thinking, you know, it just sounds like work to me, and so I'm I'm like, well, maybe, you know, why do you want to do that? Uh, We're not very good at at growing things. We've only grown a few things in, in our lives. We've grown these bushes, and, you know, our kids, we've grown some kids, and and I'm kind of proud of the bushes, you know, and so I, I'm like, why do we want to do this? And, and uh, she said, well, they're just so big. They got so big, and they've been here the whole time we've lived here, and, and maybe that got me a little defensive, you know, the things that have grown too big and have lived in that house the whole time she's tired of, and so I start thinking, you know, I say things like, well, I don't know if, if we transplant these bushes, we're going to have to dig them out, and they're They've grown, and how deep are these roots that we're going to have to dig? And then, then what are we going to do? You know, where, where, Sherry, get a plan because where are we going to get the soil to put back in the the hole? And I'm just, I'm building my case. I'm a little defensive. She wants to get rid of these things, and I start thinking about, you know, how far are those? Is that root system going to go into the earth? And and to sort of provide, uh, you know, defense for my uh, position, I'd look up redwood trees. You know, have you ever been to California, seen these giant redwood trees? They can grow 300 feet tall. They can be 15, 20 feet in diameter, weigh just hundreds of thousands of pounds. And, And you would think that something that big, that tall, would have to have this significant root system that would just go deep, deep into the earth. Actually, there's no tap root on a redwood tree, and the root systems only go five to ten feet underneath the soil, which, look, I'm a preacher and not a, you know, I didn't do well in physics, but that seems like how in the world could that work, that a tree towering hundreds of feet tall would have a root system that's just a few feet under the ground, and and the way these redwoods get away with it is that they grow in groves, and so there are all these trees growing in close proximity to one another. And these root systems that start out as individual roots or or a root system with each tree ends up intertwining with hundreds and hundreds of other trees. And so it's like a game of like Red Rover when you played as a kid or linking arms together or think a a chain link and and their strength is in that interlocking of the roots one with another. And so that one tree sort of becomes a hundred trees and that's the way this, this root system that doesn't go very far under the earth allows this tree to, to grow and grow and grow hundreds of feet into the sky. Now, so much emphasis in the New Testament is placed on our growing up in Christ, our maturing in Jesus. And I started to think, you know, what, what's the key to growing up in Him? What's the key to maturing in Jesus? And for sure, as believers, we'll even use this language. We'll say, man, we have to go deeper. And I suppose there's truth in that. But I also believe that we have, to, we have to, just like those redwoods, we have to expand our community and lock arms with them so that one becomes hundreds and the hundreds become one. If we want to grow up in maturity in Jesus, we have to get rooted I think there are three priorities that are taught in this this lesson, this sermon, this conversation, this farewell address that Paul offers to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20. We're going to begin in verse 17 and read through verse 38. I think there's three priorities that are emphasized here by Paul that can help us to get rooted and to grow up in Jesus. If you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to open them up to Acts chapter 20. We're going to start in verse 17. It's quite a bit of scripture. I think we're going to read these, uh, this scripture kind of chunk by chunk as we tackle each priority. Three priorities that help us to get rooted and then to grow up in Jesus. Priority number one, the first priority 
is to understand the mission. We just start here in verse 17. I'm going to read through verse 27. This is what God's word says. Now from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, you yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and the Greeks of the repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, I'm going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore, I I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all of you, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. And and so Paul begins this discourse, this farewell address with the uh, elders in Ephesus, and and he uh, just makes this first priority known to us, that we need to understand the mission. Well, our story begins here in verse 17, and it just sets up the scene a little bit. Now from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them. And so he's going to begin this sermon, but these couple of first verses uh, just illustrate to us how much Paul cared for the elders and the church in Ephesus and how much those folks in Ephesus cared for him. If you remember, last week Paul is, is in a hurry to get to Jerusalem. He wants to make Pentecost in Jerusalem, and so he decides, I can't stop in Ephesus. And I think mostly because he, he knows that if he stops in Ephesus, the reunion tour will just be too great. It will just take too much time. There'll be too many people anxious to visit with him, and there'll be too many folks that he's anxious to minister to and to reach and to uh, have conversations with and to meet with. And so he decides he's going to sail around Ephesus, and he goes on to this this town of Miletus. And and Miletus is about 35 miles by land from Ephesus. And so when when Paul uh, gets to shore there, he sends somebody to to Ephesus to say, send in the elders to me. 35 miles. So somebody has to go 35 miles. I suppose if that person is really trucking, I mean, you can run a marathon in four or five hours or what have you. So if he's really going good, he's going to get to Ephesus in one day. But then how many thousands of believers are in Ephesus? And so how many elders are are leading this church, a, a church that meets house to house? And so probably there are an elder or multiple elders in each one of these house churches, how many folks are making this trek to to Miletus? We really don't know, but it's more than one, and it's going to take longer for them, this caravan of people, to get from Ephesus to Miletus than it did our one marathon runner to take the message to Ephesus. Paul is waiting three days, five days a week, for all of this to transpire. This is a, a good deal of time, and I think it just gives us a glimpse of how much these guys care for one another, that they're willing. Paul, who's in, so anxious to get to Jerusalem, will set aside this time. Sherry and I were in Manhattan this last Thursday, and uh, we had lunch and visited with Zoe, and, and at lunch I, I told Sherry, hey, there's this... Uh, fruit farm outside of Topeka that when I was a kid we used to go and we would get these apple slushes at this fruit farm. And why don't we take Highway 24 back home and we'll stop at this fruit farm and we'll get this apple slush. And I was pretty excited about this, reminiscing about my childhood. Sherry just kind of looked at me like, whatever. And, and so I, I said, we're going to do this. And then the, the day got over and, you know, I, I preached in the chapel there at MCC and that was, you know, and had lunch and we were just ready to go home, and I was kind of tired, and and I thought if we take this highway home, I'm going to have to go this speed, but if we go back to the interstate, we can go this speed.
speed, and I decided it wasn't worth it to stop for this. You know, the 12 extra minutes was just too much for me, right? I just couldn't handle it. And that's sort of how we approach things in in our world. Think about this commitment that these elders in Ephesus make. We're going to take this round trip 70 miles. We're going to walk on down. We'll walk on up. We'll go back to visit Paul. This is just a, a glimpse of how much they care for one another. And when the elders arrive, Paul begins to share with them. And he, just, he begins by just emphasizing this first priority. You need to understand the mission. Paul says at the end of verse 18 here, he says, you, you yourselves know how I lived among you for the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plot of the Jews. You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time. Time. Paul spent a better part of three years there in Ephesus, and he just reminds them, look, you can, you can take a look. You can remember the things I did, the, the lessons that I taught, the relationships that I built. He said, my life is a life worth following. He, he's not claiming to replace Jesus. He's just saying, and as much as I follow Jesus, you can follow me. He said, my life is an example of to you. In the letter that he writes to the church in Ephesus, he said, I I pray that you will walk or you will live in a way worthy of the calling for which you've been called. And here Paul simply says, I've done that. I've lived a life worthy of the calling for which I've been called, and now you can follow my example. I don't know if you're a college football fan, but if you're a KU fan or a K-State fan, things didn't go well this weekend. And uh, I've been kind of following college football, and there's an interesting story with a quarterback in Nebraska. This quarterback at the University of Nebraska is uh, is a, a freshman, and he's a very talented quarterback, evidently. But he he dresses, and he has the same haircut. I think we have a picture. He emulates Patrick Mahomes. And I suppose if you're a college quarterback with aspirations of playing professional football, if there's one quarterback that you would want to copy, then probably that would be Patrick Mahomes. But this guy goes as far to style his hair in a similar fashion. He wears the same sort of sunglasses that Patrick Mahomes wears. He chose number 15 for his jersey because that's the number that Patrick Mahomes wore. And in fact, in their latest game, he ran out of the team's uh, tunnel at the beginning of the game and he sort of copied the the pregame celebration or warm-up that Patrick Mahomes Holmes does. It's just a little bit, well, creepy, if you ask me. But, but I guess you, you have to give it to him. If you want to, if you're going to play quarterback and you want to emulate someone, then you might as well follow the example of maybe the best quarterback in the world, right? Paul is here saying, I've lived a life that's worth copying. I've lived a life worth following. So do the things that I've done. He said it wasn't always easy. You know that I've ministered humbly and through tears and that there's been obstacles, that things haven't always gone smoothly, but through it all I've lived this life that you can follow. I've lived this life as an example. Paul's telling these elders, man, that's the kind of life you ought to live. Truly, as a follower of Jesus, we can't kind of lay that responsibility off on, on our preachers or our pastors or, or on our ministry team leaders or on our elders. That's a responsibility that certainly falls on leaders in the church, but it falls on every single one of us, whether you consider yourself a leader or not. You know, he, Paul wrote to those saints in Ephesus and said, yeah, live a life worthy of the calling for which you've been called. And that's a responsibility that each one of us bears. Paul goes on to, in this uh, discourse with the, the elders to say, I not only led by example, but I wasn't afraid to teach 
the word. And when, when things needed to be said out loud, I was there to say them out loud. Verse 20 says, I, I, I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to the Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, I'm going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that an imprisonment and afflictions await me. Paul said, I know it's not going to get easier, but even when it was difficult in Ephesus, I was willing to proclaim. I didn't shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable. Sometimes we, we, we are into this idea of I need to live this life of an, a, as an example, but we get to that point of having to share the story of Jesus and we kind of get reluctant to do that. Uh, I, I don't know what the best way to do this, but I, I, I uh, remember this equation from this author and preacher, Bill Hybels. They, his life has gone haywire. He kind of, he didn't live a life that was worthy of an example. And so I'm not sure if we're supposed to share things. He said, I don't know how that works in the world, but we're going to go ahead and do this. I, I think this equation still holds merit. And it's from this old book that he wrote called Contagious Christianity. And the idea is just like the title sounds, right? How can we live a life that other people want to catch? And he has this equation, and, and it goes like this. He said, uh, HP, which is high potency, and the idea here is a life that's filled with integrity, with character. In other words, just like Paul said, I've set this example. We ought to live a life where we treat others and, and we, we are loving others and we're living in such a way that we can be highly potent. We have this character and integrity that, that others can look well upon. So HP, high potency, plus CP, close proximity. In other words, we need to be living in relationship with others. We have to be growing relationships with believers and non-believers. In our communities, we need to be living in close proximity to others. HP plus CP plus CC, clear communication, equals a maximum impact in our life. Essentially, this is the equation that Paul is mapping out here in, in Acts chapter 20. He said, I, I live this highly potent life. I live this life that is an example to you. And oh, by the way, I combine that with close proximity. I spent three years preaching from house to house and in public, right? He, he lived in close proximity to these folks, building relationships with them. And then he said, I, I didn't shrink from saying what needed to be said. And so I clearly communicated the story of Jesus. And, and we know the impact that that had in Ephesus and the surrounding areas in Asia Minor. Uh, thousands and thousands of people came to Christ. So scripture says that, uh, that the whole region heard the story of Jesus. So how do we clearly communicate the story of Jesus? I suppose there's lots of ways we can tell that story. I think the easiest and maybe best is for every follower of Jesus just to sit down and and think, to really contemplate, what was my life like before Jesus, and what is it like after Jesus? And then what we ought to do as we consider that, and we, we think about what the differences are in our lives, we begin to try to articulate those differences. And I would challenge you to try to write this in about a hundred words. If you can write these, this difference, your, your testimony, sometimes we'll call it in church, what is life like before Jesus and what is it like after Jesus, if you can write that in about a hundred words, you can share that story in, in 60 seconds. You can share that story in a minute or less. And then it's not as if those conversations are going to be over. People will be able to ask questions and you'll be able to continue that conversation. But it'll give you this, this basis to, to starting to have those spiritual conversations with other people to clearly communicate the difference that Jesus has made in your life. Mine would go something like this. I'm a preacher. I have a hard time with 100 words. Right, But it would go something like this. I can't really remember not knowing Jesus. I grew up in the church. There's no great conversion story to share here. I grew up knowing about and knowing Jesus most of my life. For much of that life, though, I, I did my best to tr try to just 
kind of live in categories, to have a church life and to have my life and kind of do my own thing. In fact, I ended up in Bible college not because I was committed to living this life full in, all in for Jesus, but because I thought if I went to Bible college, I could sort of placate God. I could kind of offer this up to him and keep him happy, and I could go fulfill my own plans and do my own things. It wasn't until halfway through Bible college that I realized I'm never going to be content. This, this hole in me is never going to be filled up if I try to do my own thing and ignore what God would have me to do. And so ever since then, it hasn't been a perfect journey. It hasn't been a perfect life. There's been ups and downs in life for sure. But through those ups and downs, I've experienced a peace that passes understanding and a joy that doesn't come from me. I'm not smart enough. I'm not skilled enough. I'm not disciplined enough to get through the difficult times in life on my own. I've needed the support of many, and most of all, I've needed the grace, forgiveness, and support of Jesus. You can write out your story. It, we're, not, we're not looking for some amazing conversion experience. We're not looking for, you know, sometimes I remember as a kid and you, you, you'd hear in church that there's going to be this testimony and, and it would be, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll and then Jesus came into my life. That's not, maybe that's your story, but if it's not, that's okay. Just what is your story in relationship to Jesus? You know, if you're telling me, I can't really think of a difference before I met Jesus and after I met Jesus, I'd say, let's sit down and let's talk about how well you know Jesus. Right? Let's tackle that. Because he's going to make a difference in your life. And we just want to clearly communicate that to others. And that's what Paul says here, is that I live this highly potent life. I, I live this life of character that's worthy of, of emulating, of following. I lived in close proximity, building these relationships with you. I clearly communicated the story of Jesus to you. And, and that's a life that is, has the potential to have this maximum impact. He goes on as we end this uh, first priority here. In verses 25 and 26, and it says, And now behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I'm innocent of the blood of all of you. He's had this maximum impact. He's done all that he can. He doesn't have to feel guilty. You've had this opportunity to say yes to him. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. He's done all that he can. Do you understand the mission? That's the first priority. The second priority is to be a great teammate. Paul's going to continue in this conversation with these elders in Ephesus, and he sort of turns the leadership of the church over to the elders in the next few verses. Look at verses 28 through 30 here. It says, Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, first wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock, Paul tells the elders in, uh, that he's meeting with from Ephesus. He says, pay careful attention. Some translations will just use this phrase, keep watch. I kind of like it better. It's, it's a little shorter. It, it reaches back to the Old Testament, these watchmen looking out for the nation of Israel, looking out for the people of God. And over and over in the New Testament, writers will use this language. That, that same word, that same phrase is translated keep watch or pay attention or something of the sort 24 different times. Half of those 24 times, they're talking about false teachers. And for sure, Paul is going to get to that, right? In verses 29 and 30, he talks about these fierce wolves coming from inside and outside the church. And these are false teachers that he wants the elders to pay attention toward and, and keep watch over the flock, to, to uh, take care first of themselves, 
right? Make sure they're growing this relationship with God. This is a, this is a, a oxygen mask in the airplane kind of situation, right? You need to make sure that you're caring for yourself so that you can care for the people around you. And then he said, uh, take care of all of the flock, in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. There's a couple words in the New Testament that get translated, that we translate as elders in in a couple different places. Uh, If you read the word elder or overseer or in some cases bishop or even pastor in in the New Testament, that's a different word and is used in much more rare uh, rarely than the others, you're reading sort of synonyms here. There, there's sort of all overlap. In fact, the word that gets translated as elder is really talking about who the person in leadership is. That word is, is just like it sounds. It talks at its basic, most basic level, uh, the age of a person. Of course, in New Testament leadership, we're not talking just about the physical age of a person, but the spiritual maturity of the person. And so that word elder talks about who the church leader is. This word overseer talks about what the church leader is to do. And and I talked about there being overlap, and here you can see the imagery of a shepherd or a pastor sort of overlapping here with overseer. Because the overseer's main uh, obligation, task, their main job is to teach the flock, is to feed the flock, and to provide care for the flock, to build those relationships and love the flock, and then to protect the flock from false teachers. And so there's sort of all that overlap here in these verses as Paul turns this leadership over to the elders to keep watch of themselves and the flock. Therefore, be alert, verse 31 says, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears, and now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. And so Paul goes on to say, this is how you're going to feed the flock, and this is how you're going to protect the flock. Lean heavily on God's word. And and each one of us as an individual has a responsibility, just like Paul said, take care, be alert, be on watch, first for yourselves to these elders. Well, we have that responsibility as well. It's why we encourage things like this, this fall reading plan. We want so much for each one of us to have a consistent time in God's word. Because truly, well, we are doing our very best. And I I don't think there have been any occasions from the stage where I would say, man, you need to watch out for what was said there. But we want you to be able to hear those things and to know that these wolves that Paul warns about come from outside the church, but they also rise up from inside the church. And it's each one of our responsibilities to sort of be grounded in Scripture ourselves, to to test the things said from this stage against Scripture, to make sure they they comply, that they are following after, that they're helping you to, to follow after Jesus and to learn from His Word. And so Paul says, this is how you protect the flock. You, you, you pay attention to God's Word, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel, Paul said. Uh, you yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities, to those who were with me, and all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus how he himself said it's more blessed to give than to receive and so here Paul is just saying we want to help the weak we want to serve those in need around us there's lots of opportunities to do that here at Wallula Christian Church there are ministries like uh, Shelter of Hope or or Third Thursdays we have a helping ministry here at Wallula that that serves and meets basic needs uh, for folks in our community we need more help in our helping ministry that's a hard task it's a hard ministry and if you're interested in learning more about that I'd, I'd ask you to write helping on on your communication card, on your welcome home card. I'm going to get with you this week. We have a new ministry called the Care Ministry. This is, this is probably too much information, and this is for free, but just hang with me, all right? The way we go about pastoral care here at Wallula, Wallula Christian Church is that the first line of sort of defense, where we want to know about these needs and begin meeting those needs, are in our small groups. And so just like the church in Ephesus met and cared for one another from house 
to house to house. That's how we want to function here at Wallula Christian Church. And so those first lines of, of, of pastoral care are going to come from your small group. But sometimes there are needs that are bigger than a small group. Sometimes there are needs in, in the congregation that kind of maybe somebody isn't involved in the small group. And our caring ministry helps to meet those needs. And I know they have some plans and are looking for, for more help and, and carrying out this new ministry. And, and uh, so if you're interested in hearing more about that, just write the word care on your welcome home card and we're going to help you to do that. We can be a great teammate. We can care for our own relationship with Jesus and we can care for the relationship of others around us by leaning on God's word and by meeting the needs that are present in our body by helping those who are struggling. Paul describes it as helping the weak here in Acts chapter 20. Finally, the third priority is to pray with one another. Just look at how the story ends. This conversation ends with Paul and the the elders here. It says in verse 36, And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all because uh, of the word he had spoken, that they would not see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. I started this uh, service, we started this service by saying, you know, Paul kind of has the same side of the booth relationship with these elders, and you can see it here. They just love one another, and they're sad to see each other go. And the last thing they want to do together is pray together. And there's power when we pray with one another. There's all kinds of ways that we help uh, pray with one another here at Wallula. These welcome home cards, write those prayer requests on those. We want to pray with you about those. Our small groups are great opportunities for you to pray with other believers. They're sort of these set, structured time when you know you're going to have this chance to get together and pray with others. There's the worship and prayer night on October 20th where we will come together as, as a church, but kind of as a capital C church in Lebanon. Worth County to pray for one another. Be a part of that. There's a life chain prayer event in, in Leavenworth where uh, folks will line up along 4th Street there and pray about the abortion issue. There's information about that life chain event on the Next Step station. That's on October 6th. Another opportunity to pray with one another. Don't miss these chances. Paul didn't. He took this opportunity to pray with those elders from Ephesus. I, I, I want to confess something to you. I'm not good at this. This is not an example worth following, all right? I am so very guilty when, when folks come and, and they'll say, hey, this is going on in my life. And too often, I will say, man, I'll for sure be praying for you. All right? There's nothing wrong with that. That's okay. But don't walk away from that conversation without taking a minute to pray with that person in that moment. There's so much power there. We're not not talking about, hey, you need to have a 30-minute prayer meeting, right? But 15 seconds, 15 seconds just to acknowledge, I've heard what's going on in your life. God is big enough to handle this. Let's talk to him about it right now. There's real power in that, and I'm too guilty of sort of saying, I'm, I'm going to be praying for you, and then, you know, kind of letting that conversation go. Stop. Pray with one another. That's the third priority that we have to keep in mind. You think about those giant redwood trees in 1991, in the 1900s, folks. This happened so rarely that people wrote it down. It was called the Dwyerville Giant. It was 362 feet tall, 17 feet in diameter. They estimated that it weighed a million pounds, that it had grown, and that it was over 2,000 years old, and it fell. And when it fell, I mean, people felt that. They knew that it happened. People as far away as a mile talked about it sounding like a train wreck. They heard that tree fall. As far away as 15 miles, they said they, they felt the vibrations from that falling tree. Man, when one of those giants fall, it makes an impact. 
There are so many examples we could list. We talked about this author and preacher, Bill Hybels. He fell. It made an impact when a preacher, when a pastor, when an elder, when a leader falls, it makes an impact for sure. But I would contend that when any believer falls, it makes an impact. And you want to be rooted. You want to be rooted so that you can grow in maturity in Jesus. Let's get rooted together. Let's stand and worship him.